This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. I was born and raised uh, right outside of New York City in New Jersey. Um, and those of you, those who were at lunch with me working on environmental factors were, were really were trying to recruit me into the studies that you have ongoing here because there's, there's nobody who's been exposed to more toxins than somebody who lived five miles from Sea Caucus. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so the migration, you know, has been going slowly from east to, uh, uh, east to west. I spent a short period of time in New Jersey, but I, I broke out in hives <laughs> because I swore that I would never go there uh, again after I left and went to the University of Chicago. Um, and um, I, I went back. I didn't actually move. I was living in Philadelphia at that time. I'm just wasting time until I get here. Okay. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, people who I already uh, uh, know, um, it's great to see you, uh, collaborators. Uh, really old friends like David who make me feel so young. Um, and so um, I'm going to present uh, two lectures. The first one is going to be um, much more neurobi neurobi neurobiologically based. The second one is really going to focus on sort of thinking about wh what are we going to do with all this genetic information that we presume we're going to have, thinking about ge genetics and, and, and autism and um, uh, not thinking like a geneticist, trying to use it in ways to look at uh, unique features of subpopulations, subpop which which we we've done. And my understanding is is that this is a uh, a a, uh, a, uh, a diverse audience, uh, set, setting the standard for diversity, like the federal government's trying to do. <laughs> da David will learn soon about that as he joins NIMH Council. The D word is used uh, often. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm going to, this is going to be a technical talk, talk about some of the work that we've been doing. About 90% of the time my laboratory is focused on developmental neuroscience. So if those of you who are not inter interested in it, just politely nod or nod off or whatever you'd like to do. But um, it, it's really um, uh, an illustration of my, um, my ADHD, my desire to go back and forth between fundamental mechanisms of biology which have always pulled at, at me, which is how I got into neuroscience, there was no neuroscience major at the University of Chicago, um, and um, thinking much more critically about how that research may or may not relate to what's going on in disease processes. And so I'm going to start, this is the, my uh, group um, of uh, laboratory members from last year. This is our holiday party at the house, and the gift that year, we always have unusual gifts. The gift was a caricaturist who actually did each person individually with their family and then did this group, and, and we paid him by the hour, not realizing how slow he was. It, it, <laughs> it is Nashville. Um, this is Dan Campbell, whose genetic studies I'm going to be talking about, and he's collaborating with Judy Vanderwater and the whole group here. I'm not going to talk about that research. I'll mention it a little bit in the second lecture. Um, Matt Judson, a PhD student, and Micah Bergman, uh, an MD-PhD student, some of the developmental uh, mapping studies that I'll talk about a little bit in terms of MET-expression. Um, and then Shenfeng Xu, um, who looks nothing like this. <laughs> it's, like, it's quite amazing. The caricaturist got uh, not, didn't do Dan very well. Matt Judson is like perfect. And Shenfeng, who is uh, Chinese, uh, 
you know, this is, I don't know who this was. <laughs> but anyway, he's been doing some of the physiology studies uh, in collaboration with Gordon Shepard at Northwestern, which I'm very excited about. I'm not a physiologist. I'll talk about them in very basic terms, but I think it's really exciting to think about the kinds of things you can do with animal models. So um, this is how I'm going to start out, because I think that uh, I ran a, a session with Danny Weinberger two years ago at the uh, American College of Neuropsychopharmacology meetings, and it, it was titled Schizophrenia and Cancer, Two Different Sides of the Same Coin. And, and he and I came to this as kind of like chocolate and peanut butter getting together to make the Reese's uh, Cup. We kind of bumped into each other at a bar before this meeting and started talking about it. And he and I were, were sort of on the same wavelength, but in parallel universes. Does anyone know Danny? He's in his own universe, right? Um, I'm going to take my jacket off. Is that okay? This is California, all right? <laughs> you always told me I was... Oh, okay. I forgot that I'm on camera. <laughs> okay. So, 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 the, so the thing about thinking about this is that cancer and neurodevelopmental disorders are really all about sort of this balance that biology goes through in, in regulating differentiation, the specialization of cells, and growth. And whether you're talking about autism or Rett syndrome or Fragile X or schizophrenia, which has a neurodevelopmental basis, it turns out that what we're looking at is really disruption, I, at least I think, of fundamental processes that regulate growth. And, and, and this balance, this balancing act, I think, is kind of really what most of, most of biology is sort of focused on. How does a cell maintain its appropriate state of the differentiation? How does it maintain its appropriate state of homeostasis when it matures? And how does it deal with the fact that occasionally, over time, in the, in the course history of, of an individual or an animal or an organ system, it gets knocked out of kilter sometimes. And getting back into balance is what it's all about. I'm not being zen here because all of a sudden I've moved to LA. Maybe I am, I don't know. But I made the slide before, before that. And it turns out that some of the players, the reason I started thinking about this is, you know, I'm reading about this gene that I'm going to tell you about this, uh, this MET re receptor tyrosine kinase. MET, by the way, stands for nothing. I lost a lot of beer and wine to people in my laboratory uh, because I said it stood for metastasis, and it actually stands for a chemical that was uh, dripped onto cells that, um, that became oncogenic and, um, and, and transformed. Um, anyway, the same uh, protein and, and the same gene and protein players that are involved in, in had that been involved in cancer or transformation of cells from a non-growth state to a growth state turn out to be some of the same players that had been identified in a lot of developmental disorder, in disorders, including neurodevelopmental disorders. So here's, here's an example of this pathway. Here's a cell membrane here in which we have two kinds of receptors, a G-coupled protein re re receptors which signal through RAS and PI3 kinase, and the receptor tyrosine kinase family. The really interesting thing about the receptor tyrosine kinase family and MET is, is one of those, is that it's, I think there's 68 receptor tyros tyrosine kinase, if you, kinases. If you look at the expansion of receptor families in evolution, this is the one that has undergone the most expansion from prokaryotes to eukaryotes, and, and, and eukaryotes all the way through uh, species. It's, it's really a complicated uh, uh, set of, of uh, proteins, very diverse in nature, and they're involved in all, they're very pleiotropic. They're involved in everything from uh, controlling cell proliferation to movement of cells to specialization of cells and all sorts of functions that occur when the cell is, is mature. So here are the G-protein coupled receptors. Here are the receptor tyrosine kinases. And they all share this, 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 uh, these pathways, these intracellular pathways of signaling in which the ligand binds to the receptor out here somewhere outside of the cell, and information essentially flows through these very complicated pathways. I'm sure you've seen these diagrams that look like the Tokyo um, subway system. For neuroanatomists who are in the audience, like David and myself and others, pretty simple to me. It looks pretty simple. Remember, the, the amygdala has 13 major nuclei, and probably David's a splitter, so there are probably 120 sub-nuclei in different connections. But this, these intracellular pathways are complicated, but they all seem to filter through several of, 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 these, of these pathways that are involved in regulating this phenotypic balance, as I, as I call it. In addition to which, it turns out that regulation of cancer cells and regulation of the, of the metastatic state turns out to be linked very tightly to transcriptional regulation. Right? The status of the gene in terms of its methylation state, 
um, histones that are acetylated or deacetylated confirmation of chromatin changes in these transformed states. And it turns out that there are a number of these now that have been identified as candidates in neurodevelopmental disorders. So, you know, here is just a, a, a few that have been identified in schizophrenia. These are candidate genes that have been replicated and also non-replicated. Keep in mind there's no, there's no gene that has been s completely replicated, but these are ones that have been seen at least in a number of different cohorts. Uh, they've all been identified as, as, on, as oncogenes, including catecholmethyltransferase, by the way, which controls um, a precursor for methylation of, of genes. So you look on the other side in neurodevelopmental disorders, syndromes like neurofibromatosis, um, rare mutations in P10, which gives you, you know, macrocephaly and uh, intellectual disability, the tuberous sclerosis uh, complex, UBE3A, MECP2, these are all been implicated in cancer as well. Maybe, I mean, remember, there are 23,000 genes in the human genome. Maybe it's just, you know, it's just stochastic, but I don't think so. These all have in common this, this balance of regulation. The other thing that's really interesting, there has not been a lot of epidemiology done on this, but if I were to start over again, this is which is a scary thought. This is something that I might think about because, you know, it's been looked at in cancer. It turns out that there are certain cancers that never appear in individuals with schizophrenia. And there are other cancers that are actually overrepresented in schizophrenia. The same can be said when it's been looked at in other neurodevelopmental disorders. So, for example, Down syndrome. I said, I told this to Frank Sharp today, and he was like, How did you know that? I said, I don't know, I read these, this, this odd literature. In Down syndrome, um, Myeloid leukemias are, are actually, um, the prevalence in Down syndrome is much, much higher than in the general population. But tumor, solid tumor cancers are almost non-existent. So why is that? Are we looking at this balance, in fact, uh, risk for certain kinds of disorders that end up being protective for other kinds of disorders? And you can imagine that this regulation really is, is, is really, well, it's, it's important, I think, in terms of understanding how we move between uh, uh, di di disorders of the brain and disorders that are going to end up in, in dysregulated growth. I thought I'd start off the talk this way, which is probably, I'll probably be the only one ever who comes to the Mind Institute that mentions the word cancer. Um, and I can skip that. Okay. And, and we know that, that, that some of these disorders that we have identified that are syndromic in nature, single gene disorders, which have a high prevalence of autism co-diagnosis, and some of them are listed here. Um, are involved in controlling of one very important aspect of growth. They, they control many important aspects of growth, but the one that I want to focus on, or the one I think is really relevant in terms of the topic of thinking about autism, is that in a number of these disorders, and this should tell you, without doing any other fancy genetics or going to the Broad Institute where they tell you how genetics sh should be done, um, that autism and autism spectrum disorders are highly heterogeneous from uh, genetic etiology. And for example, the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder diagnosis in Timothy syndrome, which is a mu mutation of a, of a voltage-gated calcium channel, is very high, 75, 80 percent, I think, when, in the cases that have been looked at. In Angelman syndrome, depending upon who you, who you talk to, please answer the phone. 50 to 75 per percent. These are completely different gene mutations, completely different genetic etiologies in terms of risk. And, 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 and so you know just from looking at this that there is diversity and, he and heterogeneity. What do they have in common? Well, we know from some of the, path from the pathological studies that have been done, the neuropathology, that synapses and spines are targets in a number of these disorders. Are they the primary targets? Well, I think that's what we're trying to work out. But we know that is, in essence, these disorders are really disorders of connectivity. And of course, it makes sense when you think about it um, that we're looking at, at disorders that are fundamentally um, characterized by problems in information processing. Right? And, and you could imagine that one point of convergence should be the place where information processing, inf information flows, and where information is in integrated and processed, and that's through connections across the very complicated nervous system. So that's my bias, and I think, again, all of this leads to thinking about the fact that ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder, is genetically, in terms of risk, highly heterogeneous. You don't have to wait for the whole genome association studies to come out. You can cite Pat Levitt and say, well, look at all those syndromic disorders where there's high prevalence of autism 
uh, autism spectrum disorder co-occurrence. Are they all the same in terms of the autisms? We don't know. They're probably not. They probably have really special features. So Dan Gesherin and I wrote this uh, review article last year in Current Opinion Neurobiology, um, and we came up with this horrible diagram. Um, and um, it's horrible because he insisted on these colors. Uh, and, and I really wanted, you know, the orange and white Tennessee vol colors. Mm. For those of you who have ever been to Tennessee, uh, orange and white and Rocky Top. Right? You guys know the song? Of course you know the song. That's the only song they have in Nashville. Um, so, so this really um, is, a, is a summary reflecting the different genetic etiologies that we already know about without going any further in terms of the, the, the etiologies that underlie different kinds of, of, of autisms from syndromic disorders to um, what now is, I think, pretty firmly established, a, um, a subpopulation of individuals who have de novo copy number variations, meaning duplications or deletions of, of, that, can, that can range in size from being very small to being very, very large. Trisomy 21 would be an example of a copy number variation, very, very large. Um, there are rare and private mutations that we know about. Um, I wanted to make this circle very large environment, and um, uh, Dan resisted. We know now that there are, uh, the, the implications for epigenetic mo modifications are pretty significant now, at, at least uh, some of the initial work coming out. And we know that there are subtypes that you can look at in terms of, of, um, of differences in, in language delay, developmental regression, big brain, uh, seizures, gastrointestinal complaints, or, uh, or immunological dysfunction has been reported. I'm going to talk a little bit about the GI work that we've been doing in the second lecture. I'm not going to talk about it uh, here. So that heterogeneity, we think that we've hypothesized, actually can be looked at from a molecular perspective in thinking about these complex signaling pathways. And that the heterogeneity, in part, is going to be defined on where the hits take place. That is, if you're upstream, meaning that you're at the beginning of the pathway. And this is a complicated slide, a complicated pathway. It can't be that complicated because I drew it, so it's not terrible, I don't, I don't think. But here's the ligand. Here's the growth factor. This is the only known growth factor for the MET receptor, hepatocyte growth factor. Like most growth factors, it starts out as a pro protein. It has to be cleaved, it has to be processed in order to be become active. So you already have, early on in the signaling pathway, you already have a point of, of regulation that is likely to generate differences in signaling properties for, for this and differences in phenotypic head, um, uh, outcomes that would be far different than if you targeted one of the intracellular components of the signaling pathway, for example, AKT here. So the way this pathway works, I'll go through it quickly, is the pro-protein is processed. There are a number of different enzymes that can process it, including um, uh, urokinase plasma plasminogen activator. There are all sorts of regulatory proteins here. Um, one of the receptors that we worked on, the urokinase plasminogen uh, activator receptor, PLAR, uh, enhances processing of this, of this growth factor. Here's met here, like all re respectable receptor tyrosine kinases, there are two components to it. When the ligand binds, it dimerizes, and that couples it to the mysterious intracellular pathway. Nobody really knows which proteins MET interacts with inside of the cell, and we're doing that now. Um, and, and then it signals through uh, two different pathways, either through the ERK pathway uh, or the PI3 kinase pathway, both of which get you to, M, uh, to M mTOR. And I've already mentioned the fact that there are a number of components from syndromic disorders that are already in this pathway that have been identified as risk factors for increases in autism prevalence. P10, rare mutations, neurofibromatosis, AKT, uh, the tuber sclerosis complex, which is homartin and tuberin here, they've been identified as well. And I'll tell you about some of the genetics that we've done to get us into this thinking about these receptor tyrosine kinases, such as uh, MET. Um, there are three players here that have been identified in terms of genetic uh, risk factors. Uh, MET itself, uh, which has been identified and now in, has been replicated in five cohorts, the original cohort and then five additional ones. Um, uh, two others by us and the other, and the uh, one, two, three. So three other cohorts by independent laboratories. Serpene one and PLAR, uh, Dan uh, Campbell has done the genetics on these two as well. 
um, and they show alleles that are associated with autism as well. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven players that have been implicated. And if you include, for example, um, a disorder like Smith-Lemley opitz, where you've got cholesterol biosynthesis problems, RAS activation is highly dependent upon uh, that component being uh, um, functional in order to signal through the ERK pathway. So if you wanted to stretch the limits, extend your hypothesis even more, it would be eight here. I think, not just our data for MET, as you'll see, this really tells you that there's something going on with this pathway. I think it's, it's about as, as uh, solid, we have, solid evidence we have that there, that there is some convergence here in the signaling pathway. There is another component that, that, that Tom is going to talk about. Tom Bergeron is coming, and he's going to talk about the structural components uh, that are important in building a synapse, and they're likely to be uh, targets as well. So let's, talk, let's focus on that. When is it expressed? So these are just western blots where we're looking at the protein. This is anterior cortex, that's mostly frontal cortex, posterior cortex, which is mostly the visual cortex, and the striatum. This is just uh, our simplified rendition of when things happen in the mouse brain. And this is embryonic day 16, so there's very little. There's, there's more in the striatum, actually. And this, actually, I can tell you now, is contamination from the anterior commissure, which has a huge amount of MET in it. So growing axons have a lot of MET, and I'll show you that in a minute. And then it goes up during synaptogenesis, stays up, and then it comes down. And in the adult, there's some here, but it's at much lower levels than during development. If you look at its expression, this is in situ hybridization at embryonic day 18 and a half. Um, this is the subplate, you can see a little bit here. This is the uh, caudal part of the, of the developing cerebral cortex here. You can see it's very high and the onlogin of the hippocampus wraps around and then it sort of trails away. There's nothing down here. Now MET is expressed early in development, like around mid-gestation in the mouse, in peripheral ganglia, in motor neurons, and in and, uh, uh, some other regions of the developing brainstem, particularly cranial nerve motor uh, uh, neurons, and then it goes away. And people had already shown back in 1996 that that MET-HGF interaction is important for axon guidance for motor axons, right? And there's not data yet in the, in the sensory and the autonomic nervous system, but we're working on that now. So it's expressed during very restricted periods of time in different parts of the nervous system, and then bang, it goes away. If you think about that, vulnerability to disruption of the signaling system by different environmental factors that end up happening in first, second, or third trimester are going to be impacted by when the expression of this molecule is turned on or turned off in different parts of, of the brain. Okay, so here's the, here's the in situ hybridization, um, and this is immunocytochemistry. This is postnatal. They said this is 17 and a half days. You can see that it's in uh, axons here. Uh, at postnatal day seven, you can already see very heavy staining in CA1, deep layers and superficial layers of the cortex, and it's the anti-layer four marker, as far as I can tell. It doesn't label any neurons in layer four. In fact, we think, without going into detail, that it's, it's marking in the cortex projection neurons that project from one cortical area to another. It's layer two, three, and some, and some in layer five. It's, it's labeling the cells in layer five that project down into the stratum. By in situ hybridization, there's never any expression of the transcript in the stratum, but there's a lot of protein, and it's coming from the axons coming down from the cortex. It's in the thalamus, it's in the developing thalamus, but only because the axons from the cortex that project back to the thalamus express this protein. It's not in the tectum, it's not in the brain stem in those axons, and it's not in the spinal cord. So it's a very select subpopulation of projection neurons in the cortex. Cortical cortical, cortical striatal, cortical amygdala, I shouldn't leave that out, David, I, I apologize, and cortical thalamic, and that's it, okay? All right, let's, let's, let's move on. Just, just to show you again without be laboring this, this is at uh, embryonic day 17 and a half, 18 and a half, you can see the developing cortical plate and some, some labeling in the subplate, here's the intermediate zone. These are just autoradiograms of the location of the uh, tr transcript, and you can see, this is postnatal day seven, you can see what looks like holes here in the tissue. That's actually layer four. That's in somatosensory cortex. How does that look? Can that look good? That's pretty good. 
So if I were dreaming of a, of a marker for large projection neurons to these, you know, these areas, um, uh, this would be one that would, boy, I, this, this would be one that I would want to try to isolate. And here you can see P14, it's loaded at this period of time during peak synapse for, um, for formation. And here's the, this is the transcript, but there's a little bit of a disconnect between the amount of transcript and the amount of protein, which is right here. Okay. The other thing I wanted to show you is that you know, we have a conditional mutant, I'll get back to that in a minute, in which we've deleted this gene from just those cells that arise from the dorsal pallium. I'm preparing you for when John Rubenstein comes. Right? Remember to, to just ask him how the 49ers did this year. That's all you need to do. All right, I know. Um, so dorsal pallium gives rise to the neocortex, to the hippocampus, some associated subnuclei in the amygdala and parts of the olfactory cortex. Um, and so we've deleted this gene from just that domain. And then we've gone on and used that to stain, to, to demonstrate that the, um, uh, that the expression of the protein in the forebrain is due almost exclusively to its origins as being produced in the cortex. So here's neocortex in the wild type animal. This is the, this is the animal in which the gene has been deleted from the cortex. It's basically gone. This is the corpus callosum. This is postnatal day seven. I think you can see how heavy it is here, and it's basically gone, right? And I'll show you this right in thalamus. You see the same, oh, here, here's the data here. But I better move on otherwise. So, you know, when we look at where this is expressed or where this is produced, it's produced in these primary sensory and association cortical areas. It's in the cingulate. It's in CA1 only, not CA3 and not dentate gyrus, just CA1. It's in the enteronal cortex, of course. It's in subnuclei of the amygdala, some of whom, some, some of those nuclei project to the bed nucleus. The bed nucleus itself does not express this, this protein. The mammillary bodies, not the anterior thalamic nuclei, but these projections here. You can see that it's not the PAPE circuit, but uh, Paul McLean would look at this and he'd be pretty happy with this in terms of its overlap with some of these fundamental structures that are involved in limbic circuitry. Okay, here we go. In human, it turns out that some uh, work that Dan Geshwin and his post dive Zohar Mukamel have been doing with us, uh, they started looking, this is a 15-week oh, gestation from the University of Maryland collection. Here you can see it here, heavy in the temporal lobes. Uh, not much up here at this time and almost nothing in the hypothalamus and the thalamus. So it's in the temporal lobes in the developing uh, human. You can see it here. I, I don't know whether that's specific or not. We, we just need a lot more material, particularly from the monkey, to be able to map this out both pre and postnatally. This is a really striking picture. So this is a parasagittal section. This is frontal occipital. This is the temporal lobe in all its glory at 16 weeks of gestation. Look at that. Unbelievable. So this is a pretty selective gene in terms of its expression. We were completely shocked by that. Over time, you start seeing it in, in other cortical areas, just like you do in the rodent, but it's very accentuated in the temporal lobe. We know it's in the amygdala because we've actually done some early postnatal staining in the monkey, and we know it's there as well. So it's going to be worth m mapping this. So what does this receptor do that has this really remarkable selectivity in terms of expression? Well, it turns out that all those people who draw the diagrams of synapses and dendrites and the, mo and the molecules that play a role in re regulating that, they must not like this protein or something. Or That's a good one. I like that song. So um, Alan Davies um, did, did some studies in which he, um, there you go, okay. I usually talk over them, but that was a tough one to tell you. Al Alan Davies did some studies in which he introduced dominant negative forms of the receptor that essentially blocked the ability of the endogenous receptor to signal, and he got stunted dendritic growth. There's one study that's been done that shows that adding hepatocyte growth factor when you uh, use uh, tetatic si simulation in hippocampal slices can enhance uh, LTP. I'm not going to show you the data today, but in those mice that I told you about where we've deleted this, this receptor from the cortex of the hippocampus, they have uh, long-term potentiation problems. So you can induce LTP, but it doesn't sustain it for a normal period of time. If you grow cells in culture and add HGF, you can see increases in expression of NR2B. Uh, you can see increases in expression of CAMP-K2. This is work that Tyndale and Wallaconis have done in dissociated hippocampal uh, 
neurons. They claim clustering. I don't think the data is great about that. It needs to be examined in much more detail by somebody like Kim, Kim McAllister or somebody like that who, who has the skill level to be able to do that. But it's, it's been identified as an important signaling system in axon guidance, cerebellar development, autonomic nervous system to develop it, and cortical interneuron development from our own lab. Um, and there's some complications to this that I'm not going to go into. So what, what have we done in our lab? Well, Shen Fang Shu uh, has done some initial work looking at this. We've, we are in the process of analyzing uh, about 400 in, uh, intracellularly injected pyramidal cells in four different cortical areas. That's Matt Judson, part of his thesis project. We'll have the data shortly. Um, uh, but that, that's all done, and he's analyzing the data now. So you can introduce uh, MET with an expression construct. So here's an individual neuron grown in culture. You can see the dendrite. You can see the, sorry, you can see the axon. You can see the dendrites growing. And these are just uh, drawings here showing that uh, you can use um, a knockdown approach either, e either with short hairpin uh, RNAs, which will reduce expression or overexpress the receptor and, and throw HDF in. And you uh, essentially can show that you get this increase in axonal growth when you overexpress the receptor and add hepatocyte growth factor. There's a small significant effect in these experiments that he's done. These are hippocampal neurons grown in in, in vitro for, for um, I think, uh, here it is, day three, and then um, uh, processed after five days. So these are eight days in, in vitro. So there's a, there's a dendritic effect. The striking thing to me was when uh, Shen Feng looked at um, uh, spine development, and this is, uh, this is actually, I think, better than FMRP in terms of the manipulation. So here's a control. This is GFP. This is overexpression of MET, these, these pr the huge increase in pr pr protrusions. A number of them look very atypical, and this is when you knock it down. So you can essentially, and here's the data here, this is uh, um, uh, no difference in expression. This is essentially wild type, overexpression, knock it down. So you can essentially show that you can titrate the number of spines, that, uh, number of protrusions, not spines, number of protrusions. We don't know whether these are real spines or not. But this clearly is a molecule that's regulating dendritic, axonal, and spine growth as, as, as well. Um, he's done some really remarkable studies now using in utero electroporation. You take a mouse during pregnancy, you inject a plasmid, you inject DNA into the ventricles, and you apply an, an electrical current David, you, would you come up here so I can demonstrate? No. Just. <laughs> you apply electrical current, and you essentially electrophoresis that plasma because it's DNA, it's, it's charged, right, to one side. And we've used this now in, in several studies looking at circuit development, just in very basic studies. Well, Shen Feng has done this by, um, uh, by introducing these, uh, this, this um, uh, short hairpin um, RNA, um, RNAs for MET that will essentially reduce the levels of expression. Here are neurons in CA1 that receive the uh, GFP. This is GFP only, but essentially the neurons look the same when you, when you electrophorize. So you can essentially label a small number of neurons, and then you can monitor their, their morphology when you alter the levels of this receptor. So you're doing this in vivo at about embryonic day 14, I think it is. And then you allow the, and then you put the uterine horn back in the mouse, sew the mouse up, and they give birth, and everything's fine. You can look weeks later, you can do months, and you can actually do f physiology on these guys now because you can identify them. So here's GFP only, so this is normal. You can see the rather dramatic increases in what are probably basal or dendritic pr pr protrusions here. This is a, a, a CA1 neuron that has had the siRNA to reduce met expression. And here in vivo, you can see what happens when you knock it down. When you overexpress, you get this enormous increase in, the, in these protrusions, but they look very immature, very I immature com compared to what you see here. I don't remember the age of this. I think this is something like postnatal day 28 or 30. So it's close to puberty. So again, in vivo now, uh, what I showed you before was in vitro. In vivo now, you can manipulate the um, growth of of what are obviously the focal points of connectiv connectivity. Okay, um, this is just the, uh, the quantitative analysis. So I think it's important that when Thomas comes to give his talk that he include this ligand, this receptor at the, at the synapse, or certainly at a, at a maturing, in a maturing neuron in which co 
connections are being formed. So I've drawn this in here. This is from uh, Persico and Bergeron's um, review in TINS in which they identified some of the key players in bringing synapses together and forming them. Shank 3, neural ligands, the norexins, these are all important structural and adhesive proteins that are really critical in, in synapse for, for, for formation. MET is probably playing a role. We don't know exactly what it is yet, um, but I'll show you some in vivo data in a moment uh, that suggests to us that it's certainly important in regulating the organization of circuitry. So with all that biology in mind and keeping in mind that this gene in the human is located at 7Q31, which, for a long, which is a linkage peak. It's been replicated more than any other linkage peak. Now, what's interesting about this is that these are all, this is a paper from Jim um, Sutcliffe's lab, and these are all the genes that they actually looked at after, under the linkage peak. And the reason I had to draw MET in there, of course, is because they didn't never looked at MET. So why didn't they look at MET? Anybody? Well, if you type in MED in PubMed, you get 7,000 papers all about cancer. So why in the world would you ever look at, at that gene? So they never looked at that. FOXP2 has been looked at, WINS, CCFTR, I can, go on, I can go on and on. So Dan Campbell in my lab, a brave soul, he, um, who had background in Drosophila genetics and some mouse genetics, we decided by collaborating with Jim Sutcliffe and Tony Persico that we would launch a genetic study. And so we did this with the AGREE sample initially. And what we found that um, the DNA that encodes the gene is inherited in two blocks. You know, the parts of DNA are inherited together. So when you look for overtransmission of a gene or some variant of that gene, some sequence variant, from parent to child, you don't have to look at every part of the gene. You only have to look at those parts that have markers on them or single nucleotide polymorphisms that are inherited to together. So these funny RS numbers, essentially, because um, there are a lot of non-geneticists here, right? You basically identify markers within these blocks of DNA. These are haplotype blocks that get inherited together. And you screen those. The gene is 21 exons. It's not a huge gene, but it's fairly complicated. A uh, number of introns. And I'll tell you about the regulatory region in a minute because it's really interesting. So the block of DNA that gets uh, inherited together, these two blocks, this includes the five prime regulatory region and exon one. This block is everything else. And when we looked at transmission of these blocks based on these markers that we were analyzing, there was overtransmission uh, from parent to child, those children who had autism in the AGREE sample. We started out with uh, 200 families. So this diagram is what we published in the PNAS paper. This just shows log scale of the p-value. These are the markers from 5 prime to 3 prime along the gene that we looked at. This dotted line is significance after you correct for multiple comparisons. Remember, the more you compare, there's a rhyme to that, but I never come up with one. But you have to correct for multiple comparisons so you're not looking at something that's just simply stochastic. And when you do that, we identified in the original sample, the replication sample of 500 plus families, and then the combined sample, a p-value of, um, and Dan and Stan Campbell insist that I put all the zeros in, uh, 5 times 10 to, to the minus 6. So this was, uh, we, we felt a very strong, uh, very strong genetic evidence that in fact there is a, um, an allele that's overtransmitted from parent to child uh, in these families. Now, when we looked at individuals with ASD and compared them to unrelated controls, this is what we, we see. When we looked at the allele, which turns out to be a C instead of a G, we again found that the C is overrepresented in individuals with autism, but it's not black and white. In fact, most of these alleles that we're going to look at, that one looks at, not rare mutations, but these common alleles that are represented in the population are, are not going to be um, diagnostic by themselves for the, for the, for the, the disorder. So in the, in the cases that we looked at, 58% uh, had the C allele, 47% in the general population without, aut without autism. So overrepresented, but not solely represented in the autism cases. And that's important. When I talk to families about this, I point out that there isn't going to be any single marker that's going to be diagnostic, right? There just isn't. Okay. See, the seal oil is not diagnostic by itself. Okay. So here are the replications now. Our original two families. We published a paper on uh, serpene and PLAR 
in autism research in 2008, we had another 101 Vanderbilt Tufts families that Jim Sutcliffe had ascertained. We replicated it there. Um, the Sousa et al. paper just came out from the European group, Tony Monica. Tony is a wonderful geneticist who, who has uh, a history of, of invalidating everybody else's initial findings. So I can tell you that when he replicated this with a different polymorphism in the first intron, I'll show you that, but nonetheless replicated association of MET with autism. I was, you know, it was a really good bottle of wine I opened that, that, that night. And then finally, there's a Charlie Schwartz's lab down in South Carolina um, with 200 plus families has actually replicated the same SNP, the same SNP in that five prime region of the gene. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six independent cohorts now. Okay, in addition to which, uh, there was a paper published last year by Steve Scherer looking at 26 de novo copy number variation cases. Um, and two of the 26 are located right smack where MET is, is in 7Q31. So this means that 8% of the of the de novo C and V's that they identified in, in individuals with autism, 8% of those are located right where MET is, is located. These are not inherited deletions, these are de novo. They're not in siblings and they're not or in mom or, or dad. Finally, we actually reported in our sample uh, two uh, coding mutations that actually are functional in five cases and two controls. We didn't have a large enough sample Dan is now going to go back and look at a much larger sample size. So there are a single, um, single nucleotide polymorphisms that change this coding region. It's right in exon 14 where the receptor inserts into the membrane, so it actually alters signaling of the receptor. It was first identified in, in, in cancer, actually. So Dan wrote a review about this, and, 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 and this just illustrates that, in fact, we now know there are four different ways of, of, of showing association with autism. Our original polymorphism, uh, this new one that was reported by the European group, both of these are functional. They bind to uh, transcription factors. Uh, there's the copy number variation data, and there's the, uh, there's the rare mutation data as well, which is not illustrated here, all of which can impact the levels of MET expression. The other thing that we looked at to determine whether this receptor was, this, this allele was um, over-transmitted in autism spectrum disorder in general, whether there was some specificity or, or uniqueness to the populations, we looked in the AGREE sample at um, those families in which there was ADOS, ADIR, and a clinical diagnosis. And not everybody in that, in that collection actually has all three. But we didn't see a difference in um, over, over transmission. But we did see a difference when we divided the families into single incident or multi-incident, or simplex and multiplex. Now, of course, you, you all know this better than I. Cate cate categorizing a family as simplex is a little dicey because you don't know if there was stoppage, if, if they only had one child and, then, and, and they had one child and then, and then they stopped. So there's a little bit of noise in this, but you know a multiplex family for sure but there's more than one child with autism and they've been characterized. So here's our SNP again. The green is multiplex and the USC maroon color is, is simplex. And you can see all the signal is in the multiplex families. In fact, 85% of the agree families are multiplex, right? A little different than the charge sample, right? And so um, we think, in fact, this allele is over-transmitted only in families in which there's more than one uh, child with, um, uh, with autism. That if you use this as a marker for look for overtransmission in simplex families, um, unless you have a very large sample, you're not going to see a, a, a signal. So this is one way of subdividing the population. In the talk I give uh, later on, I'm going to talk about the work that we've done looking at this allele in medically defined subpopulations of individuals with autism, focusing mostly on gastrointestinal disorders. And there was a reason for that that I'll get into when I talk about that. I can skip that. Okay, the additional two parts of the pathway that I already told you about, PLAR and serpene, Dan showed that there's association with alleles in both of these genes. I can skip that. They too show the same thing, that you see the allele over transmission. This is for PLAR in uh, multiplex families, but not in simplex families for any of these markers here, okay? And 
For serpene one, it's the same thing, multiplex and not simplex. Okay, so are the associated alleles functional, right? And I'm going to focus mostly on the initial variant that we described that is in the five prime region of the gene. And, you know, genetic studies are going to have to deal with the fact that once they identify statistical association or overtransmission, th there, there's going to have to be some trans, trans, transformation into what, 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 those, what, what that means biologically. If those variants are not functional in any way, then you're looking at a, a relationship that has unknown um, uh, impact on the biology of the system. And I think that's really important. Important. So this is where the polymorphism is located, 20 base pairs upstream from the transcriptional start site. I'm not going to show you the sequence of this, but it turns out that this region was a real bear to genotype because it's 85% Gs and Cs, 85%. So you can't do a normal PCR and sequencing reaction in order to uh, assay this. You actually have to make a much larger um, Amplicon, about 600 bases, and then go in there and do that. In fact, Tony Monaco couldn't get the assay to work. We, we, we asked to have one of his people come to the lab. He used another technique to look at, at that. It turns out that um, uh, this has a number of putative transcription factor binding sites in it. So we did sort of the obvious experiments first. We took uh, this sequence, and it, all we did is change a G or a C. It's 30 base pairs. We, we put radial label in, in that, and then we run out nuclear extract, and we just ask the question, does that sequence bind to anything in the nucleus, any nuclear proteins? And the answer is yes, right? So this is um, an electrophoretic mo mo mobility assay. And so the dark just indicates how much of the probe is binding to the protein. Equal amounts of nuclear extract are loaded. And you can see that if you're a G, you're binding much more nuclear protein than if you're a C, dramatically re reducing the amount of nuclear protein. Okay. And so you can actually then de determine whether that's functional, not just from altering the binding of nuclear proteins, presumably transcription factors, but you can also then take that piece of DNA, put, hook it up to a reporter gene, put it into a cell and say, well, how much of the reporter gene is transcribed? Right. These are, no, these are um, assays known as luciferase assays. So we did this in three different cell lines, a human cell line, and two different uh, mouse neural cell lines. Here's the transcription you get with the G. Here's the transcription you get with the C. Now keep in mind, this is a much larger piece of DNA. This is um, a few hundred base pairs. There are multiple sites in there that are theoretically transcriptional regulatory sites. And yet, changing one base was sufficient to reduce transcription of this gene. Now, I mean, this surprised me, because when you read the literature, it's pretty unusual to find a single base change having this much of, of an impact on transcription, particularly when you've got a piece of DNA that has so many putative regulatory sites in it. So this is a pretty damn important site. And we know, I'm not going to show you the data, this site binds to the transcription factor SP1. And if, you, uh, if, you, if there's a G, it binds it uh, tightly. If you, if you have the C, it binds much less of SP1. So we think we figured out the mechanism of why there's less of this gene transcribed. SP1 is a positive transcription factor that amplifies the uh, amount of transcription that takes place. I'm going to skip that. And then finally, um, we wanted to know whether this functional allele at least correlated we call it functional now because it reduces DNA transcription, right? Uh, does this correlate with anything we can see in clinical cases? And for that, we had to do post-mortem analysis. We got samples from uh, <clears throat> the Autism Tissue Program collection that Jane Pickett runs. We did this in collaboration with Tony Persico. And so here's uh, just several pairs for illustration. These are Western blots. This is a control. Here's a case. Here's a control. Here's a case, here's a control, here's a case, right? So, and when you do the average, there's about a two-fold decrease in the amount of MET protein in the temporal lobe of individuals with autism spectrum disorder. The sample size is small, it's seven, but the variance is pretty good, actually. So we've gone from a genetic variant, I've talked to you about the biology, the genetic variant that we've identified, over transmission. The variant is functional because it alters how much of the gene is transcribed. 
And in addition to that, uh, there's a reduction in the amount of protein. And I'm going to talk about in the second lecture how you can get reduction in the protein, not simply just from genetic um, mechanisms, but there are environmental factors that we know now that are very important that can actually influence the levels of MET expression as well. I can skip that. Okay, so what are the functional consequences of altering MET signaling? Well, to do that, we went back into the mouse. And we've done some behavioral work so far. I'm just going to show you this is all preliminary, unpublished data. Don't go back to your lab and get, get your MET mice out that I know you have hidden. Uh, to, to, to do this. So this is just one example in which we looked at, this is the elevated plus maze. You guys do mouse behavior here? Anybody raise your hand? Don't be shy. There are four of you. Okay. Don't let the clinical people intimidate you. Mice have rights. Okay. So this is the elevated plus maze where you basically monitor the mouse. Here's a mouse here going all the way out to the edge. This is another mouse line actually. Uh, this is our fearless mouse. Uh, <laughs> And, and then you monitor how often it spends out in the open arms versus the closed arms. Obviously, if they spend more time in the closed arms than the open arms, they're more anxious. And so um, this is a percentage of total entries into the open arm versus the closed arm. Uh, purple is the, uh, whatever that is, that darker color is, is the mutant mouse. This is the wild type mouse, so they spend about half the amount of time, uh, percentage of time uh, going into the open arms. This is the latency to enter into the open arm. There's a very strong latency, so they're really behaviorally inhibited from going into the open arms. The, the, the percent of time they spend in the open arms, when they go in there, they get out of there really, really quickly. So they're really anxious. So the other thing we looked at is um, just a simple task to look at their ability to, um, to uh, um, uh, discern social and non-social odors. And these non-social odors are identified chemicals. And so uh, typically what you see is when you present the same odor and over and over again, by the time you get to the third trial, the, the mice habituate because it's not a novel odor anymore. And both for the wild type and null, you're seeing that. And then when you present another odor, this is done on a Q-tip with a mouse in its own cage, you see them respond again. Now they do show an attenuation, but there's a lot of noise here and there's no statistical difference between the wild type and the null. But they're showing the proper habituation and then response to the second novel non-social odor. When you look at the social odor, so what's the social odor? We, 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 we put a few teenage males in their own cage for a week, give them pizza and beer. No. <laughs> You put them in a cage, and then we collect uh, at the bottom of the cage after about a week onto, onto Q-tips. That's, that's social odor. Okay. And so um, here is a social odor. This is a second social odor. You can see that their, their uh, time that they spend investigating the social odor is much attenuated in the mutant mouse that does not have met compared to the wild-type mouse. So there are two behaviors that we think at least are significant. Whether they're related to autism or not is a completely separate issue. But they're showing uh, a lack of, of, of responsiveness to a social odor, and they're showing normal habituation to non-social odor. So we think their olfactory system is intact. OK, I'm almost finished. We start a little late, but I'll get there. So the electrophysiological probes. The last set of experiments I'll, t I'll tell you about are experiments that we're doing in collaboration with Gordon Shepard um, from Northwestern U University. Um, I met Gordon when he was five years old. Um, at Yale, he was on the front porch of his dad's home. His, his dad is Gordon Shepard, the guy who did the, all the olfactory work. And, um, and Gordon doesn't remember that we, we, we met then, which I was pretty insulted about, actually. <laughs> so Gordon, working in Carol Svoboda's lab, developed this um, um, a technique that other labs have used also called laser scanning photostimulation, or LSPS, for mapping cortical circuitry in which you actually soak a slice of the, of the tissue in a cage glutamate compound that requires activation by a laser or uncaging. And that then will act as, as, as an excitatory neurotransmitter to stimulate where you've uncaged. And your precision is essentially defined by, I think it's on this next slide. Here we go. Let me go, let me go back. The precision is essentially how focus your laser is and how precise you are in moving the laser along your tissue slice. And they've developed this methodology where they can essentially step uh, the laser as, as, as little as I think 5 or 10 microns. So they can be very precise. So essentially it's a grid in which you activate. And then you activate 
oops, sorry, you activate in one part of the cortex and you record activity responses in a neuron that's distant from where you're uncaging the glutamate. And there are criteria that they've analyzed over, over, over time to be able to tell that you're looking at a direct synaptic connection between the place in which you've activated the cell and where you're recording from the, the, the cell. So I wanted to skip all the simple experiments and just go right to this experiment because if this protein is important as we think it is in regulating these aspects of growth of spines and dendrites, et cetera, is there a, a, a functional readout of this in terms of altered connectivity? And doing it neuroanatomically is not easy unless you're looking at a robust perturbation. But doing it physiologically will give, gives you the precision of being able to look synaptically and say, are we looking at a less precise circuit, a more precise circuit? Is there overrepresentation or underrepresentation? Right? You can do all sorts of things doing the physiology. And so Shen Fang, who is a physiologist and started doing, was doing a lot of LTP work in my lab after Ed Weber left Vanderbilt, went up to Northwestern and learned this technique in like th three days, which if anyone's tried to do this, is pretty amazing. So here's the slice. Um, this is from the frontal cortex. And the experiment is done by essentially recording from identified neurons. And the way you identify them is a few days before you're going to make the slice, which is somewhere between 20 and 25 days postnatal, so it's before puberty but after weaning. This is in mouse. You inject a tracer into a location where you know the neuron is projecting. So we looked at cortical striatal neurons. We inject the tracer and then we can identify the retrogradely filled neurons uh, microscopically and then you can actually patch onto those cells right, with a patch electrode and you can record from them. So you're not just recording from any willy-nilly neuron, you know that that neuron is a layer 5 neuron that's projecting to the stratum. Okay, So we've done that and you can do all sorts, I'm not going to go into this because um, you can look at membrane properties and other sorts of things to know that you're patching onto a cell that's healthy and that has appropriate membrane properties, et cetera, et cetera. And when we did this between the, between the wild type mice and the mutant mice, the sort of the standard physiological properties and those characteristics are essentially not different between mutant and wild type. Okay, so here's the grid, <clears throat> here's the electrode, and essentially what you can do is you can map um, both um, um, indirect and direct responses. And an indirect response has a certain sort of a, a, a wave form and a direct response in which you're uncaging the glutamate right over where the cell that you're recording from is sitting. You can see a direct synaptic, uh, a, a direct non-synaptic response where the glutamate is essentially activating that, that, that cell. So up here, it's the indirect response, this cell connecting down here, et cetera, et cetera. And so you go through that and this is what you see. This is sort of the bottom line because I'm running out of time. Um, I've never presented this data before, which is why it's a little long-winded. I, 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 I apologize. So if you look in the control, and you basically can generate a heat map that essentially, and what you see here is the boxes are the cells that were recorded from. The blackened areas are uh, the areas of direct responses that we don't care about. We just care about the indirect response, the connections from superficial to deep layers. So this heat map is essentially a map of the um, strength of, of, of activation of these neurons down here by activating cells up here by uncaging glutamate. So here's the heat map for the wild type neurons. Here's the heat map for the MET knockout mice. And here is the difference between the two. There's about a two-fold increase, or a hyperconnectivity, if you will, a two-fold increase in strength of activation between superficial and deep layers. Two-fold increase. Now we went back and did experiments I'm not going to go into in which uh, this could be caused by a lot of things. We don't exactly know why, but one of them could be that these cells up in layer 2, 3 are more activatable. They're more sensitive to the, to the glutamate. And in fact, we show physiologically that they're not. So we think there's some difference that's occurring either in the strength of the, of the connection, the size of the synapse, the numbers of synapses. We don't know, but this is the first evidence I know of of genetic ma manipulations that's, that's led to changes in connectivity this precise. This is local hyperconnectivity. And I can skip that. So a little poetic license. Dan and I suggested from work that Marcel Just and Nancy Minshew had done and, and others, and a lot of people have talked about this, that, that there might be 
the fundamental sort of bottom line about, about autism spectrum disorders is that you have local hyperconnectivity in which you're processing information within a single domain very precisely. But in fact, the problem occurs because there's long range underconnectivity or the integration of that information across cortical domains is disrupted. And Nancy and Marcel and others have shown this by looking at activation patterns um, that in fact it looks like there is at least less synchrony between cortical areas and probably many of you are f familiar with this. Nobody really had any evidence that there might be local hyperconnectivity, that is local connections between within a cortical column between deep and superficial layers might, might be increased and here we think that we've generated that. So the emerging hypothesis, this is one of the last few slides I, I have, is that autism or, or the autisms, many genes, common pathways, Dan wrote this without even talking to me, but I think he's right. There are going to be common pathways, some of which I've highlighted at the beginning of, of my talk. And really what we're talking about in terms of risk through these different genetic mechanisms but, but common pathways is that it's shifting where one is located in terms of disease threshold. That these mutations essentially are placing you along this this arrow somewhere, just like it is if you think about Parkinson's disease. How many substantia nigra neurons do you need to lose before you become clinically, b before you clinically present? 80%, 50%, you're still here. So diseases are really all about where you are on that threshold and then what's pushing you here compared to here. And it's gonna be a combination of factors. And depending upon where those mutations lie in these signaling pathways, we think that you're either going to be closer or farther from the threshold. So I've talked to you about MET, PLAR, and serpene. We've identified genetic mechanisms, common alleles. I've told you about copy number variations, rare mut mutations. This neuron is at risk. And it's idiopathic because there are probably multiple common alleles that feed into where this uh, neuron si is sitting in terms of disease threshold. Environmental factors or multiple risk alleles are going to, going to push you into ASD. In this pathway that I've talked about, this PI3 kinase pathway, we've already talked about P10 neurofibromatosis 1, AKT, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the TS locus, all of which are part of this pathway. If you're up here and there's a perturbation far upstream, you might be very far from the threshold and need a lot of pushing to get down below the disease threshold. If you're down here, you don't need much, perhaps. And then when you're looking at are other factors that change the, or um, feed into the phenotypic heterogeneity. And that's what's shown here. So I want to thank everybody. Uh, these are the people in my lab. This is a real sign, by the way. <laughs> you have to guess where this is. I, it, it, it's at a famous research institute that I was at um, uh, uh, on their board, and um, I was shocked and dismayed, but maybe it's real. These are the people who I've al already mentioned from my laboratory, and in yellow are some of the people who are, we're collaborating with on this project. I want to thank you all very much. I apologize for going over, um, but we should start the next talk later. Anyway, thank you. Not sure whether uh, we have some questions, but if we do, we'll do, I guess we get lots. <laughs> I'm going to start at the back. I always usually start at the front, so let's start in the, with Steve. Yeah. I, how I how do I do, Tony? I grade upwards. How do I do? Okay. Hi, Pat. Um, just out of curiosity, in the uh, met mouse that you put in the elevated uh, plus maze, yeah. could, you, uh, could you alter their behavior by giving them a simple angiolytic? Yeah, so we haven't done those experiments yet. We've actually done those in other mouse lines. And um, for reasons that I don't understand, we've done this in three different mouse lines where we've given an ang ang angiolytic. Um, the, the mice end up falling asleep. Uh, that is, their, 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 their dose response curve, we think, to these angiolytics when they have anxiety disorder, anxiety disorder, when they have increased anxiety. Sorry about that, I apologize. They don't have anxiety disorder, they have increased anxious behavior. When you give them an anxiolytic, they actually, uh, you know, they fall asleep. Um, it, you know, it is a sedative, and, and we've done, tried to do dose response, but the dose is so low. We haven't done it in these mice yet, but we're, we're planning on doing that. What we'd like to do is, um, we're doing now the three-chamber social behavior test that Jackie's doing, uh, Jackie Crowley de developed. But the other thing that we're doing is um, 
we want to look at the development of social behavior. And we've developed some tasks um, to look at um, cued learning, essentially, conditioned learning that has social relevance to a mouse um, that we're doing in wild-type mouse now, and then vasopressin and oxytocin knockout mouse, mice now, and we're going to start doing it in these, in these mice now. Right. Uh, <clears throat> my, my voice is pretty loud already, but anyway. Um, uh, I'm wondering about um, um, intrauterine placement and so on. I mean, if you think about that spine proliferation, with met, you know, the interaction maybe with the estrogen. And uh, you see in aromatase knockout male mice very specific deficits in social behavior as well. That uh, I'm wondering if you could comment on sort of the potential role of you know, estrogen exposure either in utero or, or, or sex differences in, in pups. So exposure, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Exposure. So, 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 you know, you, you had met, met induced uh, proliferation of, uh, of spines. Of dendrites or, right, right. right. Spines. So, and so estrogens as well will promote uh, spine. What does? Estrogen. Estrogen. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Will promote spine density. So I'm wondering if you could comment on some of the potential interactions between those things, or is that something that's been investigated? Yeah, so, uh, so it turns out that um, um, not, so we're going to end up being the experts on met transcription, but there is a group at uh, Stanford, it's a small little school down the road a little bit, uh, <laughs> That, where there's a group working on prostate cancer and MET is upregulated in highly metastasis. So if, if MET is upregulated, the, the one thing we know about MET is that in cancer, if it is upregulated on cancer cells, those are highly metastatic and it's, a, and, it's, and it's not a good thing. So it's been used as a marker clinically for looking at that. In prostate cancer, it gets upregulated. In fact, they've identified an androgen binding site uh, an androgen, androgen receptor binding site in the pr pr promoter region of the human MET gene. Um, and so we're, but they, but they, all, all they did is identify it and show that it bound. They didn't do any other characterization. They, they didn't look at sequences that were critical for that binding. We find that very interesting. Not a lot of genes have antigen, androgen receptor binding sites. MET has it. MET seems to have almost everything. In that region, I, I didn't show you the sequence, but there are something, there's like, in, um, very large CPG islands. So this is a, this is a methylated gene. Um, and in fact, that C allele changes uh, one of those CPG sites. Um, so that's the only data that, that's out there that I would suspect might uh, be relevant to thinking about uh, gender um, effects in terms of transcriptional regulation. So we're going to look at that. We don't know, by the way, if that element exists in the mouse. So there's about 70% identity between the promoter region of the, the first, the, the thousand bases upstream from the transcriptional start site in the mouse. If you look at those thousand bases and in the human, it's about 70% identical. But 30%, you could look at it the other way, 30% non-identical. We already know of one transcription factor sequence that's in the human that's not in the mouse. And so we have to look, we haven't looked yet at the mouse promoter region to know whether the androgen receptor binding site's there. Other questions? Yeah, following up on the promoter, um, you mentioned it disrupts an SP1 binding site, but with an 85% GC rich promoter, you're going to have a lot of SP1 binding sites. Yes. It's just perplexing how that one site could be affecting the binding of the neighboring sites. I agree you with have you. Have any mechanistic ideas to how that? In that region, uh, there are uh, 13 SP1 binding sites, putative 13 S S SP1 binding sites. I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm not a promoter basher, and I'm not. I'm not really an expert. I'm, I'm an expert in nothing. <laughs> I'm thinking more, more and more. So I don't know. I've talked to people at Vanderbilt who do a lot of transcriptional work, and they were surprised by it as well. But they looked at our data. They looked at our original data. There's no doubt that that one base change is sufficient. Now, it doesn't completely eliminate SP1 binding. The other thing that I thought, well, here's SP1. SP1's all over the place. It turns out that SP1 in the brain is not all over the place. So we've, we haven't published this, but we've done a fair amount of in situ hybridization because it's, it's not in many of the databases on, online because who's going to look at a generic transcription factor? But it, it actually is expressed in interesting anatomical patterns. I, I, I don't know why. But to get back to your question, I don't know how, uh, uh, unless that, that site is important for anchoring the other sites, you know, maybe that there's binding and sequence from, from you know, downstream, you know, closer to the transcriptional start site upstream, and maybe it's forming one large complex 
I don't know. We're doing CHIP and we're doing other assays now to try to determine who's in that complex. It, there also could be linkage to other things other than SNPs nearby. I mean, maybe small duplications, copy, small copy number variations. Yes. Could be affected, you know, that might be something that we... Yes. And so we don't, we don't, we, we don't know that. It could, be, it could be due to a number of things why that region is so s sensitive. I uh, agree with you. And, you know, I've got two people in the lab now. I think we, you know, the whole lab could go to this, I think, because it's, I find this very complicated. And I think that sort of the next generation of how we're going to have to deal with n neuronal diversity and functional diversity in the nervous system, we're going to have to deal with these issues, which we're not very good at right now. We know very little about transcriptional regulation of, of genes in the nervous system. I wonder what proportion of the genetic liability of autisms can be attributed to the C allele. It seems that this uh, must be a variant with pretty significant uh, effect on the phenotype, given the fact that you were able to find association with only 200 families. Yeah, so we did the relative risk calculation uh, where you, um, there are some assumptions about that, but the relative risk, I'll show this in the next, it's like two point, for, uh, for uh, being CC, if you're homozygous CC, it's 2.27. That's higher than any single SNP finding that we know of. Um, it's, it's high, I, and I, I don't have an explanation for it. And you know, I'll show, I mean, some of you may not, hard to believe you might not stay for the next lecture. But uh, when we looked at kids with co-occurring autism spectrum disorder and gastrointestinal dis disorder, uh, that the C allele was represented in, I think, 65% of those kids, 65%. It's almost getting to the point of being, you know, dare I say the, the D word. I mean, I mean it's 65%, it's not 100%, but it's enriched. I think what we're going to find is going to be, it has a modest effect size. Small. I, I would characterize 2.27 risk as small to modest. It's about the same, I think, isn't it? What's the risk, relative risk, if, if you have old sperm? Does any, any, anyone remember that data? Yeah, come on, David. It's, it's something like somewhere, it's like relative risk is like, what's that? Okay. All right. I'm not going to forget that whole thing I talked about with, with that. We have three more questions, and then we'll have to stop, otherwise we'll have to just start in this lecture, right? Oh, okay. There now is a whole lot of, many, many findings of reduced functional connectivity in imaging studies in autism. But one thing that people don't talk all that much about is that um, the vast majority of finding, um, findings of studies have shown hypoactivation across multiple brain regions. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that based on your work. Hypoactivation. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, um, I, you know, I'm not an imaging expert, so I'll, there's, there's the caveat. Um, my feeling about those is that, the, you know, you're not, you're not getting resolution anywhere near what we're looking at in terms of the physiology that I've just shown you where we're looking at, you know, essentially, um, you know, micron-wide columns of cells that are inter interconnected with each other. Um, there are issues that I think are not, con that, that are going to be difficult to sort out. For example, in those, you know, are there differences in the vascular bed between individuals with autism spectrum disorder? And this is true if you're looking at schizophrenia or, or, or bipolar. We, we very few people look at this issue in mice, for example. We've just looked at it in several lines. We haven't looked at it in MET yet, but we're going to look at it. We see vascular, we see vascular differences that are regional. They're regionally selective. Uh, the other thing is that the activation differences, keep in mind that these, these differences in activation are relatively small. In, I mean, you know, we're, you're, you're, you're talking about 1%, 1.5%, it would be a huge difference. The other thing is that when you look at the JUST paper from 2004, there are regions, that, that was the paper where they asked them to read sentences, I think. There are regions, I think it was, whether it was inferior or superior te temporal, David, maybe, maybe you remember this. Uh, one region was underactivated, the other region was, was in fact hyperactivated, that there was an increase in activation in, in uh, these were, t um, there were 20-somethings, high-functioning aut aut autism. So it's pretty heterogeneous. Some regions seem to be under, and some regions seem to be overactivated. Yeah, and a lot of the studies are sort of a cons compensatory effect, I think, in some of the regions. But I think overall it's more of a hypoactivation story. Yeah, and, you know, I, 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 just, don't, I just don't think anybody has a decent understanding of why that would, would be. 
I would think that I would say that I would think that as the studies get much more, re, you know, much more selective and specific for tasks, and they're looking at multiple areas, that they're going to see heterogeneity in that. I just don't believe it's going to be a a you know a hypoactivated brain. I just don't see it. Kim McAllister. Hi. How are you? Good. That was terrific. So hey. I'm I'm really interested in your photostimulation data and how it fits together with the spine or protrusion effects because it's it's kind of not what you would expect, right? Because you saw, if I got this right, that if you knock met down, that you get a decrease in dendritic protrusions, which you might predict would lead to hypoconnectivity, but yet with the photostimulation you saw hyperconnectivity. So what that would suggest is that you would have a decrease maybe in synapse density, but an increase in the efficacy of the remaining synapses. So have you done mini analysis, and do you see a decrease in frequency and an increase in amplitude? Because that yeah, so we haven't done those uh, analyses yet. We know that in the um, in the in the culture man manipulations that we've done, that when we overexpress met, you actually it was sort of counterintuitive to me that the minis when you overexpress are actually reduced, right? So if you so the, these these are these are min min miniature um, EPSs that you can measure to essentially look at synaptic responsiveness. And in the cases where you overexpress MET, you see all these, lots of these spine, these dendritic protrusions, we, we don't call them spines. We think they're just very immature. They're actually not, they're not making, you know, they're not maturing as functional synapses. So the minis, in fact, when you record from that cell are, are lower, are, 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 are less. We haven't done the experiment in the knockdown yet. What Shen Feng is, um, is d d doing that. But it's a Unf really different way of thinking about how you might get hyperconnectivity from a decrease in synapse density, which is something we should That's correct. And you know, whether we're looking at a true decrease in synapses, we, we just know that, ex that excitability of those neurons in layer 2, 3 that are connecting down there are not different. They're, they look identical. And he, he went back up to Chicago and did so. We don't have the setup yet in our lab. So every time we do an experiment, he's going to Chicago. Uh, I introduced him to Gino's Deep Dish Pizza, Greek Town, all, all sorts of things. Um, he, well, he's got a K99 do, so he's, he's in his uh, office, you know, pounding away. Uh, with respect to the seal allele and Matt, have you looked at the ubiquitin proteasome degradation of the MET and whether that C allele affects that? No, so we haven't looked at that. Uh, the only work that's been done looking at receptor cycling is a little bit of work that Mark Noble's done. It's an interesting study that he published in PLOS Biology in 2007 in which he essentially um, changed the redox state of O2A progenitor cells. Uh, what that does is so, so you uh, essentially activate C Siebel, which is a protein that essentially is involved in, 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 uh, in internalization of certain membrane receptors. There are certain receptor tyrosine kinases that seem vulnerable to that. Um, PDGF alpha receptor, which is uh, uh, that's a growth factor that's important for oligodendrocyte differentiation. Um, the EGF receptor, or B1, and MET. And uh, you know the manipulations he did were mercury and lead and some other things. But he could actually use um, uh, N-acetylcysteine to reverse that. And um, uh, but there's definitely increased in, in internalization through that pathway. It hasn't really been looked at in any other uh, situation. So we don't really know how the membrane receptor is um, regulated. But there's somebody else here who could figure that out pretty easily, I think, probably. Okay. So, uh, uh, so uh, for those of you who are staying or, or leaving, we have a little reception uh, after this right outside with some snacks there. Uh, if you're coming back, we'll start promptly at 6 o'clock. And uh, hope you can thank you pass out a good lunch. The UC Davis Mind Institute began in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, learning disabilities, and other brain disorders is helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please call or visit our website to find out more about current studies, our research team, and upcoming events.
So um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, people who I already uh, uh, know, um, it's great to see you. Uh, collaborators, uh, really old friends like David who make me feel so young. Um, <laughs> And so um, I'm going to present uh, two lectures. The first one is going to be um, much more neurobi neurobi neurobiologically based. The second one is really going to focus on sort of thinking about wh what are we going to do with all this genetic information that we presume we're going to have, thinking about ge genetics and, and, and autism, and um, uh, not thinking like a geneticist, trying to use it in ways to look at uh, unique features of subpopulation populations which which we we've done and my understanding is is that this is a uh, a a, uh, a uh, diverse audience uh, set, setting the standard for diversity like the federal government's trying to do <laughs> David, David will learn soon about that as he joins NIMH council the D word is used uh, often um, and, and so I'm, I'm going to, this is going to be a technical talk, talk about some of the work that we've been doing. About 90% of the time, my laboratory is focused on developmental neuroscience. So if those of you who are not inter interested in it, just politely nod or nod off or whatever you'd like to do. But um, it, it's really um, uh, an illustration of my, um, my ADHD, my desire to go back and forth between fundamental mechanisms of biology, which have always pulled at, at me, which is how I got into neuroscience, there was no neuroscience major at the University of Chicago, um, and um, thinking much more critically about how that research may or may not relate to what's going on in disease processes. And so I'm going to start, this is the, my uh, group um, of uh, laboratory members from last year. This is our holiday party at the house, and the gift that year, we always have unusual gifts. The gift was a caricaturist who actually did each person's tyrosine kinase. If you, kinases. If you look at the expansion of receptor families in evolution, this is the one that has undergone the most expansion from prokaryotes to eukaryotes and, and, and eukaryotes all the way through uh, species. It's, it's really a complicated uh, uh, set of, of uh, proteins, very diverse in nature, and they're involved in all, they're very pleiotropic. They're involved in everything from uh, controlling cell proliferation to movement of cells to specialization of cells and all sorts of functions that occur when the cell is is mature. So here are the G protein coupled receptors. Here are the receptor tyrosine kinases, and they all share this 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 uh, these pathways, these intracellular pathways of signaling in which the ligand binds to the receptor out here somewhere outside of the cell. And information it essentially flows through these very complicated pathways. I'm sure you've seen these diagrams that look like the Tokyo um, subway system. For neuroanatomists who are in the audience, like David and myself and others, pretty simple to me. It looks pretty simple. Remember, the, the amygdala has 13 major nuclei, and probably David's a splitter, so there are probably 120 subnuclei in different connections. But this, these intracellular pathways are complicated, but they all seem to filter through several of, 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 these, of these pathways that are involved in regulating this phenotypic balance, as I, as I call it. In addition to which, it turns out that regulation of cancer cells and regulation of the, of the metastatic state turns out to be linked very tightly to transcriptional regulation. Right? The status of the gene in terms of its methylation state, um, histones that are acetylated or deacetylated, confirmation of chromatin changes in these transformed states. And it turns out that there are a number of these now that have been identified as candidates in neurodevelopmental disorders. So, you know, here is just a, a, a few that have been identified in schizophrenia. These are candidate genes that have been replicated and also non-replicated. Keep in mind there's no. Oh. And whether you're talking about autism or Rett syndrome or Fragile X or schizophrenia, which has a neurodevelopmental basis, it turns out that what we're looking at is really disruption, at least I think, of fundamental processes that regulate growth. And, and, and this balance, this balancing act, I think is kind of really what most of, most of biology is sort of focused on. How does a cell maintain its appropriate state of differentiation? How does it maintain its appropriate state of homeostasis when it matures? And how does it deal with the fact that occasionally, over time, 
in the, in the course history of, of an individual or an animal or an organ system, it gets knocked out of kilter sometimes. And getting back into balance is what it's all about. I'm not being zen here because all of a sudden I've moved to LA. Maybe I am, I don't know. But I made the slide before, before that. And it turns out that some of the players, the reason I started thinking about this is, you know, I'm reading about this gene that I'm going to tell you about this, uh, this MET re receptor tyrosine kinase. MET, by the way, stands for nothing. I lost a lot of beer and wine to people in my laboratory uh, because I said it stood for metastasis, and it actually stands for a chemical that was uh, dripped onto cells that, um, that became oncogenic and, um, and, and transformed. Um, anyway, the same uh, protein and, and the same gene and protein players that are involved in, in had that been involved in cancer or transformation of cells from a non-growth state to a growth state turn out to be some of the same players that have been identified in a lot of developmental disorder in disorders, including neurodevelopmental disorders. So here's, here's an example of this pathway. Here's a cell membrane here in which we have two kinds of receptors, a G-coupled protein re re receptors which signal through RAS and PI3 kinase and the receptor tyrosine kinase family. The really interesting thing about the receptor tyrosine kinase family and MET is, is one of those, is that it's, I think there's 68 receptor chiris. This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. I was born and raised uh, right outside of New York City in New Jersey. Um, and those of you, those who were at lunch with me working on environmental factors were, were really were trying to recruit me into the studies that you have ongoing here because there's, there's nobody who's been exposed to more toxins than somebody who lived five miles from Sea Caucus. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so the migration, you know, has been going slowly from east to uh, uh, east to west. I spent a short period of time in New Jersey, but I, I broke out in hives <laughs> because I swore that I would never go there uh, again after I left and went to the University of Chicago. Um, and um, I, I went back. I didn't actually move. I was living in Philadelphia at that time. I'm just wasting time until I get here okay. individually with their family and then did this group. And, and we paid him by the hour, not realizing how slow he was. It, it, <laughs> it is Nashville. Um, this is Dan Campbell, whose genetic studies I'm going to be talking about, and he's collaborating with Judy Vanderwater and the whole group here. I'm not going to talk about that research. I'll mention it a little bit in the second lecture. Um, Matt Judson, a PhD student, and Micah Bergman, uh, an MD-PhD student, some of the developmental uh, mapping studies that I'll talk about a little bit in terms of met expression. Um, and then Shenfeng Xu. Um, who looks nothing like this. <laughs> it's, like, it's quite amazing. The caricaturist got uh, not, didn't do Van very well. Matt Judson is like perfect. And Chen Feng, who is uh, Chinese, you know, this is, I don't know who this was. <laughs> but anyway, he's been doing some of the physiology studies uh, in collaboration with Gordon Shepard at Northwestern, which I'm very excited about. I'm not a physiologist. I'll talk about them in very basic terms. But I think it's really exciting to think about the kinds of things you can do with animal models. So um, this is how I'm going to start out, because I think that uh, I ran a, a session with Danny Weinberger two years ago at the uh, American College of Neuropsychopharmacology meetings. And it, it was titled, Schizophrenia and Cancer, Two Different Sides of the Same Coin. And, and he and I came to this as kind of like chocolate and peanut butter getting together to make the Reese's uh, cup. We kind of bumped into each other at a bar 
before this meeting and started talking about it. And he and I were, were sort of on the same wavelength, but in parallel universes. Does anyone know Danny? He's in his own universe, right? Um, I'm going to take my jacket off. Is that okay? This is California, all right? You always told me I was, oh, okay, I forgot that I'm on camera. <laughs> okay, so, 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 the, so the thing about thinking about this is that cancer and neurodevelopmental disorders are really all about sort of this balance that biology goes through in, in regulating differentiation, the specialization of cells, and growth.